Good morning and welcome once again to Rima International Bible Church. I'm Pastor Frederick Madison, and I'm delighted to bring you a word from God's throne. Um, the message title is Sow Your Grain, and I was just sharing with those in the house that this message is applicable to all areas of life, to ministry. If you're a pastor watching this, this is applicable to ministry. If you're a student, this is applicable to your career as a student. And um, if you're a businessman, you, you run a home, or whatever you do, it's, it's, it's very practical. So your grain. The text is from Genesis chapter 42, verses 1 through 9. And as we always do, I kindly ask those in the house to stand so we read God's word together. So your grain, Genesis 42, 1 through 9. And we will go at the count of three. One, two, and three. Let's read with power. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt... He said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Let's read like we believe it. <laughs> Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. Three. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain. For there was famine in the land of Canaan. There's a meaning for everything. Six. Now Joseph was the governor of the land. The person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? He asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. Pretty amazing story. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege to gather freely in the land to eat your word. Thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for the gift of scripture. Thank you for the gift of a time together in your presence. Thank you for fellowship with one another. We dedicate this time unto you, O oh God, and we ask you to feed us with spiritual bread that we will be nourished and may this spiritual bread translate into every aspect of our lives that we may flourish in the land like Joseph flourished in Egypt. We give you thanks. I commit myself unto you, O God, as a vessel. My mind, my thoughts, my lips, my brain. I pray that you will use me to bless the hearers of this word. I thank you that you're kind to us always. In Jesus' mighty name and God's people said amen. amen. Hallelujah. You may take your seats. Sow your grain. Sow your grain. This is a message about the wisdom of Joseph, which we all need to be fruitful and productive and prosperous. In the land, whether we are parents or students, youth, 
homemakers, business folk, pastors. So it's a message about the wisdom of Joseph. And what we'll be doing is looking at the principles of sowing that he used. And as a, as a teacher of the word, I, I always try to make the word of God as applicable as possible. Because we don't live in the clouds. <laughs> we live on planet Earth. And we deal with real life situations. So though the word of God comes for our spirits, it must apply to every facet of our life. And that's what I will be doing. So we'll be looking at the wisdom of Joseph in managing the resources of Egypt. And um, we'll be looking at the principles of sowing. It will be a blessing. Now, tying this message to last week, a little, a little recap. Last week, we talked about stewarding the blessing of God. We said that the blessing of God produces riches and adds no sorrow. And I did say that between the blessing and the riches, there is a variance. And although we are all blessed with a common blessing, which is Jesus Christ, Galatians 3.14 says, through Jesus Christ, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit. And I describe that as, as, I describe that as the common blessing to every believer, the blessing of Jesus Christ. And I say that that blessing produces everything else. And I explain that between the blessing and everything else is a variance. Not everybody who has received Jesus Christ produces the same in every area of their lives. And I did say that in between the blessing and the results is the stewardship, how we manage what God has given us. We looked at Joseph in Egypt last week when he entered into the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And there were about five things that I identified that he did right in the area of stewarding what God had given him, the blessing on his head. The first one was that he took stock. As soon as he was appointed the number two in Egypt, he went out and took stock of everything that they had. That was number one. Um, the second thing was that he acted immediately. He did not procrastinate. And I, I spoke a lot about that last week. He went, the Bible says, as soon as Joseph left Pharaoh's presence, he began his work. He began his work. So I pray that we will not procrastinate with anything that we have to do. Amen. The third thing that he did was that he collected all the food that had been produced. And I cited an example that in many countries, lots of fruits and vegetables, tomatoes, etc., go to waste. They don't have a system to collect it, and it goes to waste. Joseph did not do that. In managing the blessing of God, we must be good collectors. And one of the th uh, two things I said that we are good at wasting in this country are uh, time and food. The, two, the two time. We waste time and it's not even funny. Young ones don't waste time. I said 30 minutes here and 20 minutes here and 10 minutes here equals one hour that you will never get back. You're going to sleep about 20 years of your life and then you have time to work. Now, if you use the time to work wastefully, if you waste that time, you, by the time you are 50, you are more like 80 because you've wasted 30 years. Let's do the math. <laughs> so Joseph was not a wasteful person. He identified everything, all the resources, all the grain, and he collected it. And he stored up huge quantities of grain. He knew how to store. He knew how to save. And then finally, I did say that Joseph was a very practical man. In being a steward of what God had blessed him with, the oversight of uh, Egypt's grain, he was very practical. The Bible says that when the grain reached a certain point, when the grain became immeasurable, he stopped measuring it. And I said, what is the point in trying to measure something that is immeasurable? That's the definition of insanity. <laughs> he was practical. He was practical. 
I quoted Ecclesiastes 7, 16. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why? Destroy yourself. And then the translation says, do not be overly righteous. And do not make yourself too wise. Basically, come down to earth. Come down to earth. Be realistic. Be practical. And do what you have to do. Amen. And with that recap of last week's message, we transition into today's message, Sow Your Grain. A message about the principles of sowing. A message about the wisdom of Joseph. And I said earlier that it's relevant and applicable to every area of life. Now, let me give a general definition of grain for the context of our message. Grain, in the context of this message, is anything you produce, anything you supply, anything you put out, anything you offer. It's a service, a product, a ministry. As, as a ministry, our grain is the word of God that we, we, we feed out week after week, and, and the ministry and the service of God that we provide. That's our grain. That's, if you're a businessman, your grain is the service or the product you offer. Students, look at me. Let me tell you what your grain is. Your grain is your mind. Say mind. No, I didn't hear you. Say mind. That's right. Your grain is your mind. That's what you are putting out right now. You don't... You don't you don't buy and sell. You don't have a job. You don't. But this is, this is what you're putting out. And, and how you put it out is going to determine what you get. So put it out into good places, into good spaces. The word of God, put your brain, your grain in there. Books in school, put your grain in there. You are sowing. We're talking about. Sow your grain. So your grain is your mind. Sow it in the right places. Can all the children say amen? amen? Sow it in the right places. Don't sow it to waste. That'll be a tragedy. And if I might add, don't sow your grain to waste on that device. You can lose 30 years of your life. 30. By the time you're 50. So that's a word for the young ones. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, we go back to the message. So in the text we read today, Genesis 42, 1 to 9, Joseph's brothers go to Egypt. And before I started the message, I said this is about at least 20 years. Joseph left Egypt when he was 17. He got into Pharaoh's office. He got into his number two position at 30. That's a 13-year span, and they have had one, they've had seven years of plenty. So at least 20 years before he's meeting his brothers who sold him into slavery and who had, for all intents and purposes, assumed that their brother was dead. So they walk into Egypt, and they're going to meet a brother that they thought was dead. Haha, <laughs> Interesting. Lesson there is that be careful what you do to somebody else. <laughs> be careful when you go betray somebody. You might see them in that interview the next day, and he's going to be on the panel. And he's going to say, oh, I didn't expect you to be here. You're not supposed to expect that you'll be there. Just do the right thing. Amen. <laughs> so the story goes like this. When Joseph, Jacob learned, learned, that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. We are talking about sowing your grain. Jacob lives in Canaan. And Joseph is in Egypt. The different estimates about the, the, the distance in travel, but at least 200 miles of travel. At least 200 miles of travel. That's about here to Delaware and back. On a on horse, um, about 10 day journey. And in between Canaan and Egypt, Jacob has heard that there is grain. <laughs> Jacob has heard that there is grain. He has learned, he has got the word that there is grain in Egypt. 
And there is no telephone, no internet, no fax, no instant, but he has heard that there is grain in Egypt. Here's, here's the word for you. Number one, people are always in need of your grain. Jacob has heard that there is grain in Egypt, therefore he asked his sons, go get grain. People always need your grain, whatever it is. Your product, your service, your wisdom, your ministry, your ideas. People need it. Don't underestimate your grain. Don't kid yourself that nobody needs your grain. People need your grain. So when you wake up discouraged, shake up discouragement and remember that there is an army out there in need of what you have to supply. Jacob heard that there is grain in Egypt and he sent all ten, he sent ten sons. That's how desperate he needed grain. The second point there is that when you are busy sowing your grain, people will learn about it. Your job, our job, is to sow the grain. Not so much tell people about the grain, but we must be busy offering the grain to the world. In the process of doing that, the world will hear about it. We must sow our grain so well that it sells itself. That one person eats the grain and tells the whole world about the grain. That's how you grow the business. That's how you grow the ministry. That's how you grow the farm. Whatever it is, do it so well that the world will hear about it. And folks will go 200 miles to come for your grain. That's the mystery about Christian ministry. We sow and we watch, we watch the numbers, statistical folks who follow the ministry, folks who listen to the sermon, and we don't know who they are, but they're somewhere. So people need your grain. Just get busy sowing your grain and focus on providing it so well that it will sell itself. Story continues. Joseph, Jacob tells his sons, go down and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. And this is literal. Grain was a premium commodity in their time. In some cases, it was actually used as currency. Now, nearly everything contained grain. Their food was mainly grain-based. Grain was also premium because it could be dried and stored much longer than vegetables, milk, dairy products, or meat. So grain, if you had grain, you had power. And Jacob says, go down and buy. Can you say the word buy? Go and buy. Go and buy grain. When you provide grain, that meets people's needs, people will have no problem paying for it. Whatever it is you offer, if you offer it so well, people will have no problem paying money for it. We often make a mistake of giving grain for free. Giving grain for free. When people are ready to buy grain. And, and that's the fastest way to devalue your grain. Some folks come to you, they said, we want to buy grain, but because your mindset is not like that of Joseph, you said, I will give you the grain for nothing. Grain is not to be given for nothing. We're talking about the principles of sowing. And God is the greatest sower. Jacob knew that to go 200 miles to Egypt, you must have cash to get the grain. Grain is pricey. Grain is precious. Grain is valuable. Grain is the gift that God gave you. And you're managing that grain. 
And between the blessing and the riches, it's depending on how you're going to manage the grain. The grain is what you produce. Jacob said, don't go and beg for the grain. Go and buy the grain. Very important. Go and pay money. Go and make a transaction and get the grain. But give something because grain is not cheap. Grain is not cheap. When do you sow your grain? Last week I highlighted a very important point that when there was, first there was seven years of plenty, and then there was seven years of famine, and famine hit the land, and Joseph waited for the famine to spread across the whole land before he began to sell grain. And I said, how, how unholy of him to do that, unholy in cold. How inappropriate. People are hungry and die. And Joseph said, I will not sell grain. It is not time to sell grain. I have to wait for the famine to eat everybody and everything in the land so that the value of the grain will appreciate. And then when it has fully appreciated, I will open the barns, I will open the storehouses of Egypt, and then I'll sell grain. Farming is the best time to sell your grain. And this whole message is coming like a parable, but you'll get it toward the end. Farming is the best time to sell your grain when supply is low and demand is high. That's what Joseph did. He delayed the sale and the value of his grain appreciated. And when it did, he decided to sell. I talked last week about the convergence between spiritual things and natural things. And the confusion. The confusion. I can imagine Christians saying, let's sell the grain today. No, don't sell the grain. You're dealing with economics. And supply and demand are speaking. Let them speak and act according to the wisdom of the world. The Bible says that the people of this world are in their own way wiser than the people of the church. Sometimes all we can do is shout hallelujah and, and ring that tambourine, but that doesn't cut it in the world all the time. We must be good at that and good at negotiating the world. That's, that's, a, that's a challenge. And I know that as we deal with each other and, and as folks deal with us, they, they deal with us with a mindset of, oh, these are church folks and so they're naive. We are not naive. Rima is not a naive church. We are schooled in the things of the Bible and schooled in the things of the world because we live in the world. We don't live in the church. We're going to be here for just a couple of hours and we're going to go into the world. And we're going to face real life things. And if you're not good at how to sow your grain, you have the finest grade A grain and you will sell it for cheap. And you say, oh, how God is bad. God isn't bad. You are just a bad sower of grain. That's all it is. And so the first point for today's message is Know when to sow your grain. Know when to offer your grain. Know when to provide your grain. Provided when it's at a premium. Provided when it is at a premium. So that when you offer your grain, it will count. Know when to sow your grain. The second point for today, know who to sow your grain to. Who is worthy of your grain? Now, Joseph in this text chose to sow his grain to an international market. I'm sounding like, like an economist. Joseph sold his grain not just to folks in Egypt. He sold it to folks in Canaan and beyond. His brothers traveled 200 miles at least. 
Joseph made that determination. You must make a determination who, who is my grain for. Because you are a custodian of your grain. The gift, the grace, the talents, the anointing, the ministry. You are responsible for managing the grain. Nobody's going to manage it for you. And you must make sure that when you carry your grain to give it to A, you must have prepared A to appreciate the value of your grain. Otherwise, your grain will be trampled upon. Your gift, that kind gesture, that, that, that care, that love, that relation, that anointing, whatever you are providing, it will be trampled upon. And you're going to be very offended. You say, oh, I, I did my best, but they didn't appreciate it because you didn't measure it well. You should have gauged that this person will have no value for this grain. So you don't give it. The Bible talks about not giving pearls to swine. It is, it is our responsibility to measure that the grain I'm offering goes and is appreciated. Your grain is not for everybody. As a Christian church, we're always doing the work of God, but we understand that there are specific people who will appreciate what we offer. And so even though we offer to the world, we pay more attention to those who will put value on the grain that we have. That's wisdom. Because the grain is precious. So Joseph chose to sell to sow his grain to an international audience. And he followed exactly what is in Ecclesiastes 11 and 6. Good News Translation says, invest your money in foreign trade. That's what he was doing. He was doing foreign trade. And one of these days you will make a profit. Contemporary English version says, be generous and someday you will be rewarded. And King James Version says, in the morning sow your seed. Sow your seed. In the evening, withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that, or whether they both. So know, your, know, know who to sow your seed to, know who to offer your grain to. Next is the question, how should we then sow? How should we offer? On what scale? What quantity? So widely, so generously, so liberally, so abundantly, so plentifully. Students, what that means is that devour your content a lot. That's what it means for you. Learn and learn and learn and learn. Be generous in, your, in, in applying your mind to your books. Be very generous. Be very liberal. Go over and above. Uh, over and above. How should you sow? So liberally. As a church, we sow liberally. We sow widely. We sow plentifully. On, on Saturday, we'll be sowing into the community. We have an event. We'll just go out and we'll give out a lot because what you reap is only a product of, is a percentage of what you sow. So if you want to increase what you reap, increase what you sow. If you want more grain, sow more grain. Don't be stingy. Sowers who have a big vision, don't sow sparingly. They sow plentifully. If you want to love, love plentifully. If you want to give, give plentifully. If you want to care, care plentifully. If you want to shepherd, shepherd plentifully. Give a lot. Don't be stingy. Stingy and so I don't go together. In relationship, give a lot of love. Give a lot of support. Give a lot of forgiveness. A lot of it. And you will get some. That's grain. You'll get some back. Amen. So broadly and so liberally. The text continues that the ten uh, brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin. He was scared. Benjamin and uh, Joseph share a mother. 
Rachel, who by this time had died. And the Bible says in verse 5, I love it, it says, So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain. It's kind of trying to itemize the folks who went down to buy grain. And he says, oh, so Israel's sons were among those. Message translation says, for Canaan too was hit by famine. New King James says, and the sons of Israel went to buy grain. What is this? How is this significant? Canaan is the promised land. Canaan is the promised land. The honey and the milk and, and the sugar is supposed to be in Canaan. But there's a famine in Canaan. Israel is the blessed one. God pronounced a blessing on Israel. But under this circumstance, Israel needs help. There are folks out there who are more privileged, more advantaged, have more money, more connections than you. But circumstances will dictate that they come to you for your grain. Don't underestimate your grain. If you look at it logically, Egypt should be going to Israel for grain. But it's flipped around. And so if you walk around carrying your grain like it's worth nothing, you're making a big mistake. Because all that the blessing is going to produce is going to be produced through the grain that you have in your hand. And how you turn and, 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 and apply that grain, that is what God is going to use to produce the riches. The grain is like the raw material. The grain. And here you have the sons of Israel going to Egypt. Friends, they're folks you never know need your grain. And, you, and you've been sitting down and saying, oh, all I got is justice. Somebody needs just that. And somebody will put money on just that. And somebody will put a premium price on just that. So the grain that you have in your hand, manage it well. Because somebody in a foreign place needs it. And they will send a troop with money to come and buy it. Amen. Do not underestimate your grain. Now they get to Egypt, and the Bible says in verse 6, Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain. Can you say sold grain? <laughs> not the person who gave grain for free. Free. Free grain. If God blesses you and the blessing produces grain and you give it out for free, you will be broke. Grain is not for free. <laughs> I'm speaking metaphorically, but I know you're applying to your life. Grain costs money. Grain is precious. Grain is expensive. Grain is valuable. And that's how we must handle grain. The church has a problem with free. Our minds are wired wrongly. We read the Holy Scriptures and our interpretation of the, all of the Scripture is that everything is free. Nothing is free. Jesus ain't free. He paid a price. That's how we got him. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to come and die and that and, and the death cost him his blood. That's a price. The fact that we didn't pay for it doesn't mean Jesus didn't pay for it. And that affects how we manage the Jesus that we have been given. That affects how we, we walk with Christ because it is expensive. That was God's grain to us. God sowed his grain into the earth. And boy, did it cost. Cost Jesus Christ. So there is nothing free in that. Grain is precious. Grain is precious. So I did say earlier that we should sow liberally. We should give without reservation. We should 
provide our gifts, our talents, and resources without holding back? Yes, but that is not equal to free. And that's an important distinction. That's an important decision. So liberally, so graciously, but as you sow, you must put a value on the grain that you're offering so that the grain will not be taken for granted. As a church, we don't sell the gospel. We, 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 give, we give Bibles for free, but the Bible is not free. We paid for it. Nothing we do here is free. I remember a few weeks ago, one young lady was looking at my microphone, the lovely microphone of one of the kids, and she was just fascinated that it was that it's a tiny microphone, and I almost wanted to tell her, that's almost a thousand dollars. So, so we sold the word of God, we blessed the world, and what, we want to charge them for money? No, that's not what I'm saying. Knowing that what we offer, knowing that the grain that the church offers the world costs, we are careful how we dispense it. We are careful who we give it to because we don't want the gospel that we give out to be trampled upon. And that's why as a church, we don't let people take anything that we do for granted because that's our grain. And we give account to God for how we manage the grain. That's why we care for how we treat one another here because we will give account. We're stewarding God's work, God's people, and that's our grain that we give out. And so we cannot allow folks to manhandle or mistreat the grain that we provide. That will be a disservice to us and the work of God. Amen. If you're in ministry, don't allow people to trample on you because of your grain. It's funny, sometimes many of the things we will not do in the world, we try to do it in the church. We say, oh, it's the church. No! It's the church, but we must be responsible about how we handle the grain, amen? Grain is not free. The purpose God gives us grain is for returns. Returns. For everything God has given you, every gift, every anointing, every talent, every ministry, it is supposed to produce a return. If it does not produce a return, you are not acting or thinking like your heavenly father. You are not acting or thinking like your heavenly father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is what return looks like. God gave one son. And he said, because I am sowing my grain, my expectation is that there must be a fruit. There must be abundance. There must be return. And for one son, God says, I want all the sons and daughters of Abraham. Everybody on planet earth. That's how God thinks. So if you have grain that you have been sowing, you should be thinking about returns. If you're not thinking about returns and only shouting hallelujah, you are misapplying the scripture. You are being irresponsible in handling the grain that God has given you. It's nothing worse like having a special gift in the family and maybe you are a tailor and you can make clothes and and, you know, ham some things here and there. And that's your grain. That's what you provide. And you give it out. And you give it out. And everybody calls you. And everybody calls you. And everybody calls you. And you give it out. And you give it out. And you give it out. And you don't get anything returned. And then you become bitter. And poor. And you say, oh, God didn't give me anything. No, God gave you grain. But you are not responsible in sowing and getting a return back. That is your gift. You have just underestimated it. You said, I'm just a guy who, I'm just a girl who hems people's pants. Well, if you hem 10 pants and you get $10, that sounds like $100 to me. <laughs> Sowing and reaping. The grain that God has given us must produce a return. Next thing I'll say, put value on your grain. When Joseph's brothers left Canaan and they went to Egypt, they didn't tell Joseph how much they were going to pay for the grain. Joseph was not ashamed to put a price on the grain. You have grain, whatever it is that you supply. 
You must know its worth. We must know the worth of what we do as a ministry and, and put value on it so that people will honor the value. That's how we are successful in whatever endeavor that we find ourselves in. So, good stewardship would let us know that we don't give everything for free. We don't. It's irresponsible. Having said that, of course, there might be situations where we do uh, pro bono work. We give for free. Absolutely, yes. But the whole enterprise cannot run on nothing. It reminds me of uh, Boaz in the book of Ruth. Boaz had a farm. Naomi brings daughter-in-law Ruth along. And Boaz identifies this new immigrant who is settling down in the country. And while they are harvesting, he says, you know that lady, when you harvest, leave some of the grain for Ruth so Ruth can eat. She's just settling. She's, she's getting her stuff together. That's pro bono. That's grain. That's giving grain. But all of, of um, Boaz's enterprise didn't run on pro bono. Otherwise, there'll be no farm. Otherwise, there'll be no wealth. Otherwise, the family will go down. So that's the difference. When you must sell your grain, sell it unashamedly. Trade it. Put value on it. Whatever it is that you do. And get the return Back, amen. Those who are likely to take your grain for granted, guess who? Those who are very close to you. Those who are very close to you. But you must be responsible for the grain. The value of grain is something that nobody must, be, must determine other than you. Your destiny is tied to the grain. How far you will go forward in whatever you do, including ministry, is tied to the grain. How you handle that grain will determine your tomorrow. So you got to be a good steward, a good manager, a one who, put, one who puts the right value on the grain. Less people will walk over you for your grade A grain. They will come around you knowing that you have grade A grain, and look at it and get a handful and say, oh, that ain't good grain. No, that is good grain. That is good grain. And you better know it, that it's good grain. And so in some cases, you don't offer the grain because they're trying to put the wrong value on the grain. I hope you are being blessed. <laughs> in some cases, you say, no, I will withhold my grain because you want to put the wrong value on my grain. Provide your grain to those who will give it the correct value. Some people are just not worth your grain. And you must be comfortable with withholding your grain. The next thing I'll say is that the value people assign to your grain is a reflection of what they think you're worth. The value people assign to your grain it's a reflection of what they think you're worth. They may not have a problem putting a higher price on that grain if it was coming from your neighbor. But because, of it, because it's coming from you, they, they want to devalue your grain because they think you are not worth that much, friend. You better know your grain. You, because your grain is important. God is counting on your grain to feed the world. That's the redemptive. God is counting on Joseph's grain to feed the world. God entrusted Joseph with grain, not for himself because he's a blessed man, but for the world. God is counting on you to feed the world. That gift he has given you is not for you and your family only. It's for the world. It's for the world. What we do at the church club is for the world. We are very aware that what we do here is for the world. I don't know a thousand of the folks who follow us. It's for the world. 
So I must handle the grain of this ministry like it's for the world. You must handle the grain of your business like it's for the world. You must handle your grain of your family like it's for the world. Because guess what? There are folks in Canaan, blessed folk in Canaan, but they're searching your family. They're looking you up. They say, what they got? They got this kind of grain. We need that grain. And it's just a matter of time. They will send an army to your house. And they will knock on your door and say, I need grain. That, that grain in your kitchen that you had no value on. I need it. Because it, 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 it was going to save us from dying. Grain will save people's lives. Grain will save people. Your gift will save lives. When Jacob sent his sons, he said that, go, get that, go buy that grain lest we die. Go get the grain lest we die. Just look at the innovation, the technological innovations of our generation and how life has become so much easier. That's somebody's grain. Can you imagine the world today without the phone, the cell phone, without GPS? That's somebody's grain. And the world is being blessed because of their grain. I, I remember the days we used to print ma uh, maps on MapQuest when we're traveling. You don't need to do that again. You print the, the, the directions and you go and something changes. You don't have a printer in the car. But you don't have to print. That's somebody's grain. They're saving the world. Friend, God has blessed you with grain. And the world out there is in famine. The world is in a famine. The reason you have not arisen, you've not woken up to your destiny, is because you have, you have under, undervalued your own grain. You have looked at yourself and you said, oh, my grain ain't worth much. That's a lie of the devil. While there are people out there in need of your grain. And as the story goes, and I'm going to be ending shortly. So when Joseph's brothers finally arrived, you know what they did? They bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. And as soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. But he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? He asked. As soon as Joseph's brothers arrived, Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Many of us are focused on making our dreams come to pass. Our, our priority is chasing dreams. And that's fine. But according to this text, dreams are fulfilled as you sow grain. Joseph had to do nothing to make the dream he had about 20 years ago come to pass. Joseph was preoccupied with sowing. Oh, you must be a sowing-minded person. Joseph was only Preoccupied with sowing the grain, blessing the world with the grain. And it was us, he did that, that that dream came to pass. Be a sower like nobody. In your family, sow. In your community, sow. In your profession, sow. In your ministry, so, this church is a result of sowing grain. That's how it evolved. We're just, we're just sowing grain with nothing to gain. Just sowing grain. And then the Lord led us. And we were perplexed and, and pleasantly surprised. We were just sowing grain. As we sow grain, dreams will come to pass. He sowed grain so much that his brothers 200 miles away heard about it and they came with cash. They came with cash and they came and they bowed down and suddenly the sowing 
brought to life and a long forgotten dream. Do you have dreams? Do you have dreams? So. Students, you have dreams? So. So the brain. Sow it into the books. As a church, we're committed to sowing. We, we, are, we, are, we are so sowing minded, so liberal minded. We look for ways to be a blessing because that's how the dream will come to pass. Church, our Heavenly Father is a great sower. And this message, uh, one that you, you know, I would recommend you go and listen to again, it applies to every part of life. I use grain as a metaphor, but I know it applies to every part of life. Go home and sit down and think about your grain. Think about the value you have put on your grain. Think about where you are trying to offer your grain. Think about who needs your grain and who must not get your grain. Look at those close to you and find out if they are putting the right value on your grain. Are you selling your grain too soon or too late? Those are all things we must take into consideration. Be like Joseph. As I conclude, be like Joseph. You got grain. And the world is in need of it. As I bring this to a close, I want to thank our friends who join us virtually. I've been talking about grain, sowing grain. Used it as a metaphor for what you offer, what you supply what you provide. I want to end with a note of the gospel. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sowed his grain. He had only one son. He sowed his grain. And he sowed it with the intent of getting a return. And that return is you. That you will receive his son, Jesus Christ, and commit yourself to walking with him and developing a healthy relationship with him. With him. If that's you, I want you to open your mouth and say, Father, come into my heart. I receive the grain that you offered. If that's you, write to us. We'll mail you a copy of a Bible for no, at, at no cost. We have paid for it. We have paid for it. But because we love you and because we know how important it is, we will send it to you out of love at no cost. Write to us. We'll do that. And find a Bible-believing church and settle down and grow in faith. If you're ever local in the Silver Spring area, please join us on a Sunday for worship and continue growing in the things of God. I'm Pastor Frederick New Madison from Rima International Bible Church, and God bless you for joining us today. Amen. Church, can you receive that message? <laughs>